Project 2025, the Heritage Foundation's creation thought to be the blueprint for a second Trump administration, has been the left's kryptonite on the campaign trail. But Democrats may have overlooked another conservative organization currently planning for a potential Donald Trump victory, the America First Policy Institute. Established in 2020, the conservative think tank has craft crafted policy proposals for a second Trump term. From the economy to immigration, AFPI is said to have already drafted over 300 executive orders ready to be signed on day one. Our next guest served as Acting Homeland Security Secretary under the Trump administration from 2019 to 2021. A year later, Chad Wolf took over at AFPI and here to discuss what AFPI has in store should Trump be re-elected is Mr. Chad Wolf himself. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So let's start with a potential immigration agenda. Trump has talked about potentially doing mass deportations, which is a position we should note is supported by the majority of Americans. But I think a lot of people are curious about how exactly that uh, proposal would be carried out. Is the idea to implement something similar to an Eisenhower era policy that had military operations? Or what exactly would be the infrastructure behind uh, carrying out perhaps tens of millions of deportations. Well, let me uh, first start off by saying that I don't speak for President Trump or the campaign. So my thoughts are, are just those based off of my experience serving the president during the first term. And when we talk about deportations, it's really important to, to note here that there is actually an entity inside the Department of Homeland Security, ICE, Enforcement and Removal Officers, that are already here, that already do this job day in and day out. Unfortunately, over the last three and a half to four years, we've seen some of the record low number of, of removals or deportations. So first and foremost, it's just allowing those officers to do their job. You've got to prioritize. You want to make sure that you are targeting the worst of the worst, right? Those are the national security. Those are the public safety threats. Those are individuals also here on final orders of removal. And then you've got to effectuate those returns. Obviously, you've got to repatriate and remove them back to their home countries if they don't have a legal right to be here. So. There is an entity inside the department. There's personnel dedicated to this. I think you could start there, um, but then there's a lot of options once you, you start to scale it um, and, and you start to move up. There's other federal entities, federal law enforcement, state and local law enforcement uh, want to help, want to be part of the solution here. They haven't had that chance over the last four years. So look, I think there's a lot of options on the table, but I think it first starts with defining who is able and eligible to be removed from the country, and then just allowing uh, law enforcement to do their job. Chad, I want to stick with immigration for a second, but a slightly different strand within it. A group that it seems to me we hear less about these days are the so-called dreamers. More than three million people fall into that category. And it strikes me that even outside of the normal uh, ideological boxes that people might fall into, there is, I think, a, a fairly broad appreciation that people brought to the United States as children, perhaps very young children, are in a bit of a different category to people who cross the, the border uh, illegally as adults. What do you think is the way forward for, for dreamers? Well, I think it's really important to really define that population. Uh, you use the term dreamers, and I think the, the number you mentioned is 3 million. I'm not aware of that number. If you just look at the DACA population, and, and that's a population that the Department of Homeland Security, for obvious reasons, tracks very carefully, there's only about 600,000 of those. Um, and I know members of Congress and others want to uh, you know, include more individuals in there, but the DACA program administered by the department is about 600 to 650,000 individuals in that. And look, I, I've said for, the, for years now that this is a population that Congress needs to decide what is its future. It continues to be in limbo. I think every court, uh, there's been a lot of different court uh, proceedings and lawsuits on this issue. Um, when they look at the merits of this program, it goes back to that the you know, President, or I'd say President Biden, Secretary Johnson, and others did not have the legal authority to actually put this program in place and court after court after court has said as much. Um, and so, look, this is for Congress to decide what is the future for this population. But again, I, I've been on record saying as, we, as Congress de debates that and they, they decide that, 
we've got to close loopholes in immigration law because my guess is in two or three years from now, we could be back here saying, well, let's talk about the 10 million people that came in under the four years of the Biden administration and, and half of them are children or two million are children and through no fault of their own, they were brought here. So let's, let's talk about amnesty or a pathway for them. We've got to stop playing this game. You've got to close the loopholes. You deal with that DACA population through Congress uh, but you've got to close these immigration loopholes that we continue to talk about these these classes of individuals here. Uh, and we continue to talk about pathways and amnesty. Let's actually just enforce the law. Let's bring in people into the country legally uh, through legal visa programs. Um, that should be the way that we administer our immigration uh, program. And speaking about potential congressional reform on immigration. There's been two competing bills in the past year, one from the Republicans in the House, H.R. 2, and then there's the so-called Senate bipartisan bill that has the backing of the Biden-Harris administration. Kamala Harris, of course, has been attacking Trump on this issue, claiming that he sank the bipartisan border bill in the Senate uh, because he didn't want it to be uh, a positive for the Biden-Harris administration heading into election season. Can you talk a little bit about what some of the Republican opposition to that bill was? Well, sure. I, again, I'll, I'll just speak from my own perspective as I looked at that bill and I, I made sure I didn't comment on it before the, the bill language was released. But as I looked at that bill, it was unworkable. It was uh, none of it was uh, tested and true, meaning that you had about three, four, five hundred pages there that was all new immigration law uh, and putting new immigration processes in place. I don't think it would have addressed the crisis. It would have allowed up to 1.8 million illegal encounters or crossings per year. It would not have addressed the catch and release. It would not have addressed child smuggling. Um, and then, of course, the trigger that a lot of Republicans and others that were talking about to where you could, quote, shut the border down, of course, sunsets after three years under that bill, but all the other provisions remain in place. To me, as an operator, that didn't make any sense to me. How could Congress know that you didn't have a crisis in four years? And then you wouldn't be able to utilize some of that authority in that bill because it had sunsetted. So I think if you looked at the bill as a whole, you said, look, that's really this is really not addressing the crisis. It didn't close many of the loopholes that we all have been talking about for years and years and years. And I think this is really startling that if the Biden administration felt so passionately about this bill, why didn't they offer it in 22 when we had a crisis or in 23 when we had a crisis? They've had the ability to do something along that border using executive authority for three years now, and they've done nothing. And it was only until an election year that they decided to put their weight behind a bill so that they could say that they have done something about the border, when in fact that bill would have done very little. Uh, I assume that's why President Trump did not like it, did not support it. But I know that's why I didn't. Um, and I've been very vocal about that. Uh, Chad, I just wanted to broaden the discussion a little bit beyond immigration itself. The, you mentioned that you don't uh, speak for former President Trump, and, and of course we, we accept your, you know, your word on that, but your, the organization AFPI, it was set up by veterans of the Trump administration, predominantly as I understand it. What is the actual function of the group? I mean, are you working toward offering some kind of blueprint for a second Trump administration if one comes into being? Well, I mean, fundamentally, AFPI was created in 2021 um, a after the Trump administration to take those America first policies that we saw during the first four years of President Trump uh, that that made the country prosperous, that made the country secure and basically started to build that out uh, here at the Institute. And so we've got 16 or 17 different policy centers. And we talk about things from national security, homeland security, like we're talking about now. But we talk about health care, taxes. And, and alike. And again, offering the American people that there's a different way to take this country. There's a different way to govern. There's a different way to approach some of these very, very tough issues that the American people are facing today. And it's not what we've seen of these America last policies over the last four years. So that's what AFPI talks about. Most, if not all of our research is online on our website. Anyone and everyone can go there and, and see about we, we publish what we call the America First Agenda in 2022, both for federal and state legislators policies that they could enact that promote uh, national uh, security, that promote national greatness, talks about patriotism, um, all of those things. Again, they're all on our website, uh, but that's the mission and that's the core of what, of what we do uh, each and every day at AFPI. Any interest in going back into a second Trump administration yourself if uh, that opportunity opened up for you? 
Well, look, I think it's always, uh, it's certainly an honor to be asked to serve. Uh, and I, I suspect that myself and many others, both at AFPI, but also not at AFPI, would probably, uh, you know, jump at the chance to serve President Trump again. Chad Wolf, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. All right. Thanks, guys.